Hello, Susan. My name is Joe Harrington, and uh, I'll be doing my version uh, of a presentation, kind of like a TED Talk, as my self-reflection. I think it's important for you, you, me to give you some context, um, a little bit of my background. When I was eight, I was properly diagnosed with ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, and my parents were very supportive, and my teachers and my coaches, and they wouldn't allow me to take any medication for it. I got very involved in athletics and things like that. Um, and as an adult, you know, I've considered medication, even though sometimes I think I might benefit from it, I uh, still try to stay very active to help me. Uh, I was a very, very reluctant reader, and even a more reluctant writer, in primary school, junior high school, and a little bit into high school as well. While taking this course, I have begun to view how technology can bridge the gap for many students. As a way of displaying my learning, I have done about 90% of this assignment uh, using voice-to-text or, or assistive technology, uh, specifically the transcript that I'll, I'll give in with my assignment has been done all using that technology. My intention for this format is to show that the technology can be used effectively and to show my growth as an inclusive teacher. I had for years been told when I was a student that I was not living up to my potential, but with the technology available today, I think I would be able to effectively able to share my ideas with, other, with people when I was a student, and which I was told they were pretty good. Week one. In week one, we discussed uh, theories of inclusiveness. When I go through these slides, I'm not gonna read the slides. Uh, you can read, this is just as a reference point, kind of on uh, my speaking points. And, and so this is, uh, go ahead and, and read those and I'll send a copy of my PowerPoint as well. Uh, so I agree with Lumpy and Coleman when they identify that inclusiveness is not about providing the same education for all, or even about teaching the same outcomes for all students. Teaching grade six provides me a unique challenge. Even though students come from all different backgrounds and levels of ability, they are still all assessed by the provincial achievement test. I find it is very difficult or almost impossible to exempt a student from a PAT, even if they're on an individualized program plan. Unless a parent decides that they are taking, taking the test would be detrimental to student development, we do a good job of identifying uh, the proper accommodations, we provide readers and scribes and things like that for the students, but the problem is, is that with remediation in reading or, or uh, any other pullout thing, oftentimes students miss classes. So for instance, if uh, a student was continually pulled out of science to, to help with their reading, they would still be expected to write that PAT to avoid a zero. Uh, I believe that for inclusiveness to be effective, not only must we differentiate between the ways we deliver instruction, but also differentiate between the ways we assess students. Instruction cannot be standardized for each individual student. And neither can we have a standardized assessment for each student. Personally, for me, my obligation is to my students develop it, not the results that the school receives, although the school continues to use PAT as a measure of success. In week two, uh, while I was completing week two's readings, I was intrigued, but not surprised by Wilson Grant's and Cameron's 2007 findings that reveal special education teachers have a more positive attitude towards inclusion than general education teachers. This finding makes me believe that our pre-service teachers and beginning teachers are not prepared coming out of university to jump into classrooms with the confidence required to manage a class with multiple levels of student ability. While, while talking with other people in this cohort group, they also confirmed that they did not feel prepared coming out of university to deal with high needs kids in their classrooms. It appears to me that there needs to be more coaching by special education teachers surrounding the strength and stretches of students who need accommodations to remain in the least restrictive learning environment. If students in school divisions 
wish to say that they are inclusive, they must be intentional in their actions and identify that their teachers are not prepared coming out of universities. I suggest that there needs to be ongoing coaching, planning assistance, and support from veteran special education teachers. All teachers in a school must be confident and have the capacities to differentiate lessons and assessments for their students. Uh, I have a video, I'm sure you've seen it. Um, and so I won't play it for you, but when you have the PowerPoint, you're more than welcome to click on it and watch it if you haven't. When I originally looked at the different leadership styles, I thought it would be drawn to the great man or character leadership styles. I've been inspired by such people as an athlete and a student. And, but after some reflection, I was surprised to find that I identify with the transformational leadership style for school reform. Although I do believe that a person's trait and their innate people skills will allow them to be better transformational leaders. Uh, still in a crisis situation and changes needed quickly, I still lean toward a great leader like a Joel Clark who has uh, their own clear vision and uh, can drive change. In week four, uh, it has been my experience that a facilitative leadership approach in schools is the most often utilized by administration. It appears difficulty arises when using this style of leadership when the administrator who should act as a facilitator has the ultimate say. In an instant where there are many stakeholders with varying roles and ideas all provide input that is ultimately rejected ultimately has to reject many people's input. In the end, decisions need to be made, but often there are factors involved that all stakeholders, stakeholders are not aware of. It sometimes feels as if a facilitative approach to leadership is a facade that attempts to include stakeholders who think they have real input, which leads to frustration and feeling undervalued. A leader must be very careful to ensure that they are authentic in their facilitative approach or you're left with staff who feels undervalued and as if they're jumping through hoops. Um, I think this is similar to when, as teachers, you know, we make class rules and expectations and we ask the students to develop it even though we already have in mind what we want. And so we kind of lead them to that, creating this facade that it's their input but really it's still teacher driven or administration driven in this case. Uh, week five, after reading Ryan's 2006 paper, my ideas regarding social justice have been verified. I often utilize a circle of courage philosophy in my classroom with an overarching emphasis on generosity. Each year I have students visit our community senior citizen center to bring Christmas gifts that they have bought with money that they've fundraised. I also have my students involved in community library project where they have uh, participated in class writing letters to in support of the library's grant for improvement and then they will also go and help tear down shelves and, and replace the books for that you know the, the service learning and all my students are involved and feel valued in that. I also have been in the past years run a social justice club in my school and after reading the value of it and I uh, am re-motivated to start my social justice programs again next year and in that program we would uh, we would have new random acts of kindness uh, we support a world vision student and then we try to get involved in community projects as well Week six and seven. So, so, well, so far, and I guess in closing, these have had the most impact on my teaching practice. I always utilize smart technologies like the smart board and the document camera dealing my classes. Since beginning this course, I have begun using voice to text with many of my students. The unique thing that I have done 
is I've completed about 90% of this paper using UDL technologies. I've done this so that I can gain a greater grasp on how to use this technology in my classroom and as an innovative way to show that this technology can be used at the university level. After seeing the advantages of the assistive technology, I know that I will be looking to use it a lot more in my classes. Legal perspective. While taking this course, I was actually provided an opportunity to travel to Hay River Northwest Territories with my vice principal, the school division's native liaison worker or coordinator, and our school division's actual superintendent. The reason for this trip was a result of a school review that had just been completed. It was recommended that we use the South Slave School Division's model to transform our school in Vilna. While I was there, I was quite intrigued by the amount of data the school had collected and immediately tried to use that, connect that to, to what we we're doing in this course. The division's attendance, parent involvement, and academic achievement are very similar to Vilna School's situation. I recognize that in order for our school to change, we first need to collect data. I recognize that our school, we collect a lot of data, but it is not used effectively to view instruction. In South Slave School Division, they use data more effectively to gauge student performance, drive professional development of teachers, and ultimately increase student outcomes. As a result of the trip, there are many things that the school division will be is doing that we would like to adopt in Vilna. When discussing with my colleagues where to start, I suggest that we first need to collect baseline data. We often have many initiatives brought to our school with no baseline to compare the effectiveness of the strategy. In this course, I wrote a post regarding attendance in my sixth grade classroom and forwarded it to my administration. From that, along with other factors, the school has begun to make more contact with parents and families whose children would be considered chronically absent. I'm excited to see the school's transformation and hope that we are able to remain focused and bring all the other staff on board. Here are some recommendations that were given from that school review. some of the, the, the Waters and White 2015, I was very intrigued by the research regarding positive change in schools. I immediately connected their findings with the situation we find ourselves in at my school. So in October of this year, the school board initiated a school review. It unfortunately had been the second school review within the last six years. Although the findings of this review were better than the one done six years ago, there is still a lot of work to be done. At the end of the review, we were given a list of 10 recommendations for positive change, and I have included three in my PowerPoint. The recommendations I have included will have the most impact, I believe, on achievement. First, we need to use the data we generate to appro appropriately to make decisions moving forward. I believe that the spirit of change began six years ago with a major focus on love and logic. I believe in the efficacy of this approach to education, but it was not fully accepted or embraced by all this, by neither the school staff nor the community at large. I believe had we collected data and used the results from the data, the second school review would have not been required. At some point through the past six years, it could have been identified that the new direction of the school was not effective and the new direction could have been implemented years ago. Regarding the second recommendation surrounding administrator development, I now realize along, along with teacher efficacy, administrator's ability to lead for change is crucial to student learning and achievement. And finally, I've included the recommendation of attendance because I hold in regard that this factor alone will increase student achievement vastly. It appears to me that I'll If we have expert teaching practitioners in our schools who are experts at differentiating lessons and 
uh, finding resource and classroom management, it's all irrelevant if the students aren't there to receive these great lessons we create. Uh, through this course, I reviewed my attendance and was very, and, and let my administrators know that 40% of the students in my class are chronically absent, missing more than 10% of school. And I was very shocked and surprised to find out later when I talked to my principal that actually my class had the second best attendance in the school. So that's, that's the situation we're kind of in with that. Uh, but I do believe that now we have a realistic, smart goal and a plan to address that. You know, every year it's been a concern, but now we have a vision and a clear direction of what we want to do with attendance. And, and it's improving already. The case studies. So, uh, in week 10, my colleagues wrote a case study regarding wraparound services and best practices for inclusion. I find it quite frustrating that youth in care are moved from placement to placement without any input from the school. These youths are often slow to attach and very adult weary. Each time a student is moved, it becomes harder and harder for them to reattach to adults. It is refreshing to see that the Americans passed legislation in 2009 regarding the child welfare system and using the school districts to make these decisions. So the legislation is supposed to be getting input from schools before moving a student outside of the jurisdiction if the student is thriving. I often hear stories of kids being pulled out of schools where they're very attached to their teachers, their coaches, and have positive relationship with peers and transplanted because the foster placement breaks down and ultimately so does the school situation breaks down. Each time these students are moved, it's harder and harder for them to reattach. Uh, so it would be interesting to talk to a teacher in America to see how this legislation is used practically. I know in Alberta we try to coordinate services using success and school plans, but it is in my experience that social workers are very hesitant to participate in such meetings, and the plan is rarely used as intended. I hope that we continue to identify our foster kids as at risk and take further measures to find path of least resistance for them, leading them into mature adults. Controversy. In week 11, my colleagues posted a case study regarding transgender child. It is very, it's really early in this, uh, kind of shift to see how children who identify as transgender at a young age develop into adulthood. I struggle to accept that, the, that it is in the child's best interest to make their feeling, their, to make them, their issue a school-wide or community concern. If I were the parent of a seven-year-old who felt that they did not belong in, the, in their body, I would normalize their feelings until their natural sex hormones are activated in puberty. I simply would tell my child that many people feel that way and it is normal. Once my child has matured, I would help them identify where they belong. I worry that making a child like the one recently in Edmonton, the poster person for transgender, is dangerous. I feel that a child who identifies as transgender at a very young age will be trapped in that role even if they begin to identify with their birth sex as their hormones start to be secreted. Clearly, we'll have to wait and see how these children develop into adulthood. Conclusion. You know, this is the fifth course that I've taken towards my master's degree, and it is odd that my participation in this course has been uh, low, but my learning has been quite substantial. I feel that I'm very close to being ready to take a principalship and this course has really helped me realize what I need to do for my professional development. It is very interesting that while I'm studying school reform in this class, I am deeply involved in transforming my school. I, I am beginning to feel, as an un, as a non-classified leader in the school, and believe I can play a, a large role in my school's reform. Thank you for the opportunity to continue my education throughout this course.
Thank you and good night.